Hi everyone. Uh, uh, I'm Jim Swami Devana, working as associate professor in the Department of Engineering at Kiliarity Hyderabad College of Engineering Program. Today I'm going to share a few topics about electronic engineering, so which can enhance your biomedical skills and be useful for you. Okay, shall I continue? I can see a few people who are still working with their headphones. Uh, Naresh, is it clear? Sir, continue, sir. Yeah, yeah. Now, let us come to the first topic. Uh, the first topic is a transit user. Transit user is such a type of device which converts one form of energy to the other form. So, here I want to give you with basic to biomedical based application things. So, whenever we speak, uh, so it's just a communication based example. So, audio signal. So, by using a transit user, it has been we do processes on it, like uh, speech processing is being done with the current and voltages and frequency, and it is being transferred in the form of sound waves. And uh, these electromagnetic waves will be received by the receiver, and they are being changed again. These electromagnetic waves are changed to the electronic signals so by the receiver. Again, the transducer changed it into sound waves. So the sound waves are being changed, sorry, sorry. are being changed to electronic signals again to electronic and finally the receiver. So the sender is sending the audio signals and the receiver is able to receive. So that's how transit user is very useful in our real world life. So coming to a few examples, the microphone which I use now. So here I speak converted into electrical signals and later it is received by all of you uh, as a sound signal that is the as all of us know the loudspeakers also and again the best example is the thermometer where the heat energy the digital thermometers which we use uh, in day to day life so the heat energy is changed to electrical signal and uh, that is being normalized and we see the display there. So that is another best example of a transducer. Even the everyday regularly used fluorescent bulb, which is backside of me, if you can see. So it is also a kind of transit which converts electrical energy to light energy. Even the position sensors, which tells about the position, a GPS signal, which we generally call it. So the location of the person is being changed into electrical signal. The pressure sensor, the force which we apply is being changed into electrical energy. The antenna, the signals are being changed into different kinds of energy. These are the basic examples of the transducer. And uh, the next topic which I'm going to do is uh, conversion of hexadecimal, binary, and decimal things. So hexadecimal, binary, all of us know it is used, uh, it is a computer language, assembly level language, where the computer can understand the code very easily. It's an order of zero. Any number can be written in the form of zeros and ones. So we can design the microprocessor or microcomputer based language between zero and one. So another decimal representation is hexadecimal representation in which we are represented with the base of 60. So it's much easier than binary decimal number. Then the log of binary numbers can be written in the form of the last two digits. Hexadecimal number can be written in the form of the last two digits. Sir, ये ये ले लेना ये दो बच्चे वाली हैं बच्चे वाली तो मैं कॉल नहीं करूँगा बच्चे वाली क्या अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ चलो तो साइ चलो ठीक है प्लीज अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ दे दो ना तो बीस दस दस हजार भी हो गया कैसी दे दो कैसी दे ना हजार कैसी दे दो हाँ हेलो दस का भी दे दो Sir, please go ahead, sir. Yes, yes. Hexadecimal number, you know, binary numbers are going to be huge. Uh, like, uh, like four digits of binary numbers can be written in the form of a hexadecimal numbers, and it becomes a very much shorter value. So, and which can be understandable to humans. So, mostly hexadecimal values are used by microcontrollers and micro. Uh, Processors whenever we code them. Here is a basic example where a binary number is being made into, I mean, a decimal number to the base ten is being made into a binary number as well as a hexadecimal number. You can see that the binary number is in uh, zeros and ones, whereas a hexadecimal number, so till nine it is like a 
uh, decimal number. After that, 10 is designated by A, 11 by B, 12 by C, 13 by D, 14 by E, and 15 by 7. So this is how a huge number, like four ones, can be represented by one year. So whenever we write assembly level language, we use hexadecimal number so that it can be understandable and much easier to both humans as well as to the machines. So binary number is to the base 2, hexadecimal number is to the base 16, and a normal decimal number is to the base 10. We'll go with the next topic, like how to talk about active and passive elements. Active elements are the things which provides energy to the circuit. So for any basic electrical or electronic circuit, we have two kinds of active elements, which are voltage sources. They can be a DC voltage source or an AC voltage source or a unit cell battery. And apart from the voltage source, we also have a current source, which give energy to the circuit. And in this active sources, these are all called as dependent sources. I mean, independent sources. We also have independent sources. We also have independent sources, which are called as voltage control voltage sources, which are being dependent on the voltage and current control voltage sources. So CC, VAC is current control voltage sources, which are going to depend on current. In a similar way, we have VCCS, voltage control current source. And similarly, we have current control current sources. All the dependent sources, as like shown here, they are being represented by a rhombus shaped symbols. And after that, active elements are also like operation elements and transistors, which I'll go in more detail in the next slide. Passive elements. Passive elements are the elements which consume energy. Basically, pa passive elements are resistors, inductors, and capacitors. So with that, I'll go in deeper with what are the active and passive elements. So solid state devices, such as transistors, diodes, LEDs, photodiodes, integrated circuits, operation amplifiers, seven segments di uh, display, they are all called as active elements because they are part of the solid state devices. They are being built from PNN junctions of the either silicon or germanium material. The battery is also active material, I have, as I have said before, because it is a voltage source. It actually acts as a voltage source. Coming to the passive elements, these are the one which takes energy from the circuit, like a resistor, which uh, takes voltage and the current passes through it. And uh, we have an ohm slot here. Here it is a light dependent resistor. We have a thermistor, the capacitor which stores energy in the form of electric field, inductor which stores energy in the form of magnetic field, a basic switch which has a small amount of drop. And also we have a resistor which is a variable resistor. And the transformer, which is nothing but a two winding uh, coil or an inductor. So these are all come under passive elements. Coming to solid state devices, solid state devices are the ones which are basically used by PNN junctions. Uh, previously, there used to be vacuum tubes before discovering solid state devices. But they occupy more space, like the computer people, you will always give an example, like a computer was almost like a big seminar. So with the invention of this uh, PN junction diode or the solid state devices, the electronics have literally come down into very small space. So the basic or the first one, first solid state devices is a basic PN junction diode. They invent different kinds of diode. And finally, the best invention in the world, which is said to be till date, is a PN junction transistor. So from the Bell Laboratories. And basically, these solid state devices are basically into two parts. They are into analog devices. They are into... Uh, uh, digital devices. The analog devices are mostly used for amplification one, whereas the digital solid state devices are used for switching because digital means zeros or ones, on and off kind of thing. So they are being used for switching kind of things. So this is uh, about solid state devices. Coming to the electronic circuit components, like in electronic circuits, we use different kinds of uh, circuit representation. So we have conductors, which are shown here. We have resistors, potentiometer are variable resistance, are the preset potentiometer with the set value. We have a thermistor where the resistor changes with respect to temperature. We have a light dependent resistor where the resistor changes with respect to the light incident on it. We have an electrolytic capacitor. Here it is written as polarized capacitor with a positive polarity to be long wire and negative polarity to be a short wire. And we have a non-polarized capacitor where uh, it is like uh, uh, we have both terminals to be of the same way. And we have the power supplies. This here it has been shown as two dots. Basically, it is nothing but the terminals, the positive terminal, negative terminal, if it is a DC supply, or it is a phase and a neutral, if it is an AC supply. 
and these are the common represent of the electronics which is shown here a diode representation light emitting diode an npn transistor an amplifier operation amplifier fuse and here are the resonators like the oscillators which are being shown a battery or a series of battery are being used and here you can see the switches basically a single pole single throw switch spsd it is called as whenever it is open here and whenever it is closed here here we have a single pole a pole but it can be thrown two times that's why it's called as single pole double throw switch spd it has a single pole over here but two throws i have i can throw it on to the top i can throw it on to the bottom that's why it's called as single pole double throw switch and here you have two two poles here and you can throw it to the two times double pole double throw switch a push button as all of us would be aware of the push button this push it it is on and again push it it comes back so it is a push button and you have different kinds of switches like optical switches we have relay and we have this contact signal which will steady later in the universe and after this we'll go to the next topic called oscillators oscillator is such a device people generally say like we don't give input but it gives the output but basically we power the oscillator with a dc supply it keeps on producing ac supply so but here the amplitude will be very less but uh, the frequency will be more so it is called as an electronic oscillators we have n kinds of oscillators which start building oscillators by operation amplifiers ic's and even by using quartz crystals the application of the oscillators are being used in radios they are being used in televisions and in the computer also uh, whenever we switch it off and after one hour it it is going to be updated with the uh, time and date of the location this is all possible with oscillations only so these are the oscillation part and coming to the other one crt to cathode ray tube so here we have an electronic gun so cathode ray tube is used in all the computers tvs and your laptop this so here crt this is called as the heart of the brain of any television or the computer once crt has been spoiled you have to replace it's a most uh, expensive one you have to replace with other it's not uh, the problem with the connections it's a problem with the total equipment so here you can see the rays of beams which hit on the screen so here we have an electronic gun which moves the electrons moves from cathode to anode electrons are negatively charged so uh, there is a heated filament which produces electrons and from the cathode the electrons are produced which moves to the anode here you can see the vertical uh, vertical plates and here you can see the horizontal plates based on the displacements of the plates the display is going to be coming onto the screen so here you can see the electrons moves from the negative terminal to the positive terminal so they move from cathode to anode so which is nothing but electrons moves electrons are negatively charged they try to move towards positive chi positively charged based on the acceleration the electrons keep on moving and we see different kinds of effects different types of images and finally as the images move faster we try to see the videos also that's the basic part of your crt cathode ray tube and let us move to the next one so photomultiplier as the name says it is going to multiply the beam so uh, let me explain it from this one we have a photocathode which produces a ray of a uh, ray of light we can say so this you can see which is multiplied it deflects onto this one these are called as electrodes uh, and they are called as dynodes actually here in the photomultiplier so you can see here when it goes onto the next one it became two and it became four it became n number of things and finally you can see here this one along with the ground we are going to measure so this is what photomultiplier it is being working it acquires light and it works on the photosensitive surface called photocathode this is the photocathode like only one light beam is going to fall on this diode and here it is going to multiply it because of the diode and here you can see the voltage dropping resistor and we are going to find the voltage at the end of the diode chain we are going to collect all these things and this is the application of the photomultiplier like a single beam of light can be multiplied n number of times so that the brightness generally we talk about brightness in any device it can be multiplied by using such a kind of device and coming to the test equipment in electronics it basically starts with multimeter as it names multimeter it measures many things it measures the voltage ac voltage dc voltage 
uh, which is only amplitude, which measures current, it measures resistance, it measures the connectivity of a transistor, it connects capacitance. And we also have a capacitor, inspection capacitors being used to find out the voltage and current waveforms. And here is the new equipment, digital storage oscilloscope. Previous days, we used to have analog oscilloscopes. Now we are being equipped with a digital oscilloscope. So where we can uh, take a uh, print screen, we can connect the data in a, uh, uh, in a pen drive, and we can see the output on the monitor also. We also have frequency measuring instrument. We also, uh, we also have a programmable DC electronic load, telling about uh, how much load we have connected to the system. We have logic analyzers to know the digital logic. We have function generators which produce various kinds of waves, sinusoidal wave, square wave, triangular wave at various frequencies. Here we have, these are the various auxiliary devices to uh, cable testers and networks. We have radio frequency test equipments to know the frequency. And there are also special devices like sonometers to know the sound or the Audio, audio measurements can also be tested. These are the equipments basically used in electronic field or in electronics. Now coming to the next equipment called transformer. Transformer is a basic device which converts uh, electrical energy from one circuit to the other, which are not electrically connected, but magnetically connected. So it's basically a static device which, can, which changes electrical energy without changing the frequency. So this is the basic diagram of a transformer where here we have a primary winding where we give the supply. So here is the secondary winding where we give the load. You can see this particular circuit and this particular circuit are completely different. But they are connected by something called magnetic core. So they are connected magnetically but they are being separated electrically. It's a static device. So uh, never ever we never see a transformer moving up and down or it is a rotating paper. So it's, that's why it starts with the definition like it's a static device, but the frequency cannot be changed. If the input frequency is 50 H, then the output frequency will also be 50 H. So this is the basic uh, representation of the transformer uh, or a distribution transformer actually. So these are the radiators uh, because uh, there is a lot of electrical change or uh, there is a lot of electrical energy change from one circuit to the other circuit. This heat is being produced. We have an oil tanker here, and these are the these are called as bushings where we give the input. Here it is a three phase transform, uh, which is being stepped down to you can see four wires to a star connected one R Y B N. So and R Y B N, you can see R Y B, and the green color or the black color is to be white, which is a neutral. It is a distribution transformer which is regularly used at all, and the input is R Y B. So this is a basic. Uh, distribution transformer which works on this principle. So generally we uh, tell like this is the magnetic flux which interacts with both the coils and produces EM. So that's how the energy is being transferred. So coming to the distribution of an electrical system, so the power will be generated at power generating uh, stations, whether it can be hydro power, thermal power, or renewable energy sources, and it is being given to the power transformers. So the energy produced will be of 11 kV or 25 kV. In order to reduce transmission and distribution losses, we step it up and we give to the transmission lines. You would have seen huge transmission lines at the power generating station whenever you visit it. And later we go to some other substation, which is called as transmission substation. We step it down and we, you can see the difference between this towers and this towers, where they are being uh, different because uh, this transformer step down the voltage. And here we have few industries, a uh, few high level industries. And this is all about transmission. And later we come across something called distribution. So uh, distribution in the sense we still use the step down transformer. We give it to various industries or malls or uh, some different loads in the agriculture load, commercial load, industrial load. And this one comes to your domestic load, which is all the residential uh, consumers. So I'll show you with the values. So this one. So here you can see the power generation station. We have a power generator. So the power is stepped up, stepped up from 25 kilovolts to 400 kilovolts in order to reduce the transmission and distribution losses. Later it is being stepped down after certain kilometers because the, uh, the distance between this one and this one is almost hundreds or 500 kilometers. In order to reduce the distribution losses, we use this picture. So we step it down to 275 volts and it is being given to another transformer which again steps down to 132 volts. 
and again after that we have at 132 kilovolts we have a high industry large scale industries and later it is being stepped out to 33 kilovolts we have a small scale industries working on 33 kilovolts so at our houses we have that 33 kilovolts is being stepped down to 11 kilovolts and again at our domestic houses like independent houses the 11 kilovolts is being stepped down to 240 volts and it can be used for the agriculture applications or domestic applications or you know small level of commercial applications this is a basic block diagram of uh, uh, how the electrical energy moves from generating station to the customer so this particular part is called as generation this is called as transmission transmission part network and the bottom part is called as distribution networks once it reaches our homes residential colleges malls it is called as utilization so totally electrical energy is being divided into four phase like generation transmission distribution and utilization so that's how it is going to work now coming to the batteries batteries are huge and of varieties which i want to show here they start from AAA batteries, which we keep in our uh, remotes, uh, TV remotes. And they go with A batteries, which we use in uh, torch lights. They go with uh, C batteries, D batteries. And slowly, you know, it goes with 9 volts battery, which we keep at our multimeter. And finally, it goes to a battery. The level keeps on increasing. So finally, it goes to the batteries, which we keep in our 2 wheeler. Finally, it goes to the battery, which we keep in a 4 wheeler. Now it is very important to know about batteries because the next generation is all about electrical vehicles. So India has taken an oath like by 2030, it is going to stop the usage of fossil fuel based cars and it is all going to be an electrical vehicles car. So it's a, it's a, it's a very development fact like uh, all the state governments have recently launched electrical vehicles under their state government uh, transport corporations. Now, coming to the working principle of the battery, it's going to be a very simple thing. We have a, a cathode and an anode. We have two electrodes. So, electrons are being released from the negative electrode, which is called as anode. And you can see the electron flows here. We can measure the flow of electrons by using ammeter. It goes through the load. Here, I kept a rheostat or a potentiometer, or you can say it as a fixed resistor. And it finally reaches this cathode. So, anode is a negative electrode, and cathode is the positive electrode. They are being separated by a membrane and you can see here this liquid which is called as electrolyte in order to combine the uh, uh, ions which are presented which are being given by cathode and anode suppose i take zn s 4 electrode here and cu s 4 electrode here that zn plus and uh, zn plus and uh, it is a reduction operation which is called in chemistry where it releases electron and here this cathode absorbs the electron which is called as oxidation so, basing on this reaction, it is voltage is being produced. It is also one kind of transducer because it converts the chemical energy into electrical energy. So, coming to the batteries, they are being classified into two types of batteries, primary batteries and secondary batteries. As all of us know, we, uh, we generally use batteries in our TV remotes or in toys and we just throw them after some usage. So, they are called as primary batteries. So, they don't, we can't uh, reverse the process which is happening in them. The chemical process which is happening in them can't be reversed. But in secondary batteries, yeah, these are, these are the batteries. So, the batteries which are, you know, zinc and copper based. Batteries are being made by some chemical materials. So, whenever we study more about battery, we have to know the chemical representation and chemical composition of them. So, zinc and carbon based batteries are mostly used like in our torch light, in our radios, toys and novelties we use this primary battery and also in TV remote which I mentioned which we popularly use and everyday use it. And magnesium and manganese oxide which have high capacity, they are being used in military communication systems, they are being used in voting machines. Nowadays voting machines are also being charged, they are using secondary battery systems. So they are also being used uh, in different kinds of applications. Now going to the secondary battery, now the generation is all about uh, secondary batteries. The batteries which are there in your laptop, the batteries which are there in your mobile, the batteries which are used in electrical vehicles are, of the, are the basic examples of the secondary batteries. Why? Because they are being recharged. You recharge it, you recharge it, and it has its own lifetime. After a certain lifetime, there is a general complaint. Like my battery drains off very costly. So it also has its own cycles, which comes under the characteristics of the batteries. So basically, uh, in, our, in our electrical vehicles, we use lead acid battery. So uh, now so, uh, solar energy, so they use uh, nickel cadmium batteries and nickel iron batteries. 
and people started using nickel metal hydel batteries now the revolution or the trend is all about lithium battery lithium ion battery and lithium ion polymer battery so the electrical vehicles are concentrated mostly on lithium ion battery and lithium ion polymer battery so with the batteries we go across uninterrupted power supply so what is uninterrupted everyone would be aware whenever they are using desktop so it is ups which we generally call it as so these are, you can see the pictures these are the several ups most of us will be seeing such a kind of picture but you also have a horizontal ups so this uh, what happens in this one so all of us know so we give uh, electrical energy to it whenever there is a power cut this is going to support our desktop for some time and not only that it also protects our computer uh, or our electrical devices from power surges like whenever there is a voltage fluctuations or high amounts of voltages are coming to our system so this ups is going to be uh, supporting us so this is the basic block diagram which is present in the ups normally ups operates like this so here we have 230 ac supply uh, with a frequency of 50 hertz we have a surge suppressors we use a filter basically uh, along uh, so this filter it is connected to our computer whether you connect it to your desktop or whether you connect it to any of the electrical device so whenever there is uh, so whenever so during this time what happens the ac power is also being rectified to dc by using the rectifier and data it is connected to the battery because battery never operates with ac supply <coughs> battery operates with dc supply so it stores energy and whenever there is a power cut so the switch operates and this dc being uh, changed into ac so that's why there comes different kinds of inverters so the inverter is being connected to the load so whenever this operate when this doesn't happens so we go across this switch the battery is going to provide to the load and the battery gets discharged completely uh, we will be till it gets discharged completely will be supported to the load this is all about the uninterrupted power supply which we are going to with this i'll close my presentation and thank you all if you have any questions you can ask me thank you parish i hope we are on time uh, yeah we have another 9 uh, minutes time we have so any members have any questions you can ask yes this presentation is recorded version we will upload in the ibac youtube channel by today sir there is a one question do generators work on a same ups concept yeah i hope you can hear me now yes yes please electrical generators they are working in this different uh, completely so if you go back yeah it's a very nice question you asked it yeah ups are just you know energy transferring devices uh the input which is coming to the ups i hope i'm not able to access yes so ups you know i'm telling mains here mains uh, we get uh, 230 volts 50 h at the mains here so this 230 volts 50 h mains is coming from the generator generator works on different kinds of principle it's not you know you can see here i mean you can see this one this is a box kind of thing is it going to rotate no it's a static device right there is no movement in this uh, any equipment in the box unless you go and pick up the box so this is completely a stationary mm. device 
A generator is just like your fan, which is present up above you. It's a rotating device, you know, it, it, it rotates in a uh, uh, circular motion. So we, we have different kinds of generators. We have electric poles and uh, uh, we give mechanical energy to it. When we give mechanical energy to it, it produces electrical energy based on Faraday's laws of electromagnetic energy. So it produces voltage. So that voltage will be given here. Different generators again, DC and AC generators. So the AC generated voltage will be given here. So that will be used by our loads, either your bulb, fan, AC machine, or fridge, or oven, or anything, you know, it can be connected to the load. But here is the UPS, it does something different. It is going to charge it. It's just like your savings account, you know, like the, your, this is just like your expenses. The above top figure is your expenses, but the bottom figure is like your savings. So whenever you save it, whenever you don't have any expenses, you can use it again. So you, suppose you know your salary is thirty thousand and you say fifteen thousand rupees. So whenever your uh, fifteen thousand is over, you can use the other fifty thousand by UPS. So that's the other expense. So they are totally different kinds of things. So this is all electronic part. So when you come to generator, it is electromagnetic part and it's an electromechanical device. So it's a rotating device, but UPS is the static device which works with basic electronics. Hope I'm clear here. Yes, sir. Any other questions? You can drop the message also. You can ask the question. Hello, Swami sir. Yes, yes. Uh, sir Sanjeev here from Pune. Yeah. I want to know that suppose I am having uh, UPS in my facility mm. and I am uh, I'm using it to operate a machine. So uh, is it required, is it mandatory to have a stabilizer? Sir, your voice is not clear. Hello. Yes, sir. Hello, Gurusvami sir. Have you understood this one question? Yes, I understood the difference between UPS and stabilizer, right? Mm. Yes. Yeah, UPS or uh, you know, uh, stabilizer and UPS are totally different things here. As the name goes, you can clearly understand with the names itself. Stabilizer stabilizes the voltage. Because, mm. you know, there is a topic called power quality. So suppose, you know, uh, my fridge, it takes only 230 volts, but it can mm. withstand 40 volts. But suppose, you know, because of a short circuit or because in our apartment, people are using some other devices or, you know, suddenly there is a huge amount of voltage coming up to our, our fridge. So there's mm. a chance like it can't withheld that 270 volts or 280 volts or 400 volts coming up. So this stabilizer stabilizes the voltage. It makes the voltage. So it's supposed for the stabilizer, if the input coming is 300 volts, the output is always 230 volts, 50 H. So, you know, just like, uh, and um, uh, so it always stabilizes the voltage. It never stores voltage as like UPS. It doesn't have a battery over here. So, but in uninterrupted power supply, it does two things. Here you can see when it is just like the above part, you can see it acts as like a stabilizer. The below part you can see, you know, it it, it also gives like uh, whenever power cut is there, we have a battery. Again, we have an inverter. We can again reduce the voltage which we stored whenever we are having the supply. So that's how you can nice. connect it to any roads. Like whether it is a motor or something, you can connect it also. Okay. Clear, sir? Got it, sir. Yes. So yeah, sir. Got it, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, that's why, you know, when you look at a stabilizer, it looks like a circular surface and it is very small. But when you look mm, at the UPS, UPS is going to be, it has a stabilizer. If you go for a branded UPS, basically. So if you go for a UPS, it has a stabilizer or a surge arrestor, we call it in technical way. As like right. we call it as a stabilizer, but uh, we being engineers, we call it as a surge arrestor. And we also okay. have this battery and inverter inside this. So okay, sir. One, <clears throat> this is an automatic switch whenever you connect to it and it shows mm -hmm. the charging path you can see the red bulb here which is a charging one and uh, you can oh. see this blue one whenever it is being used and when you can see the other the green one also where you know it keeps yeah. on telling like my discharge is going to get over 
So I'm going to get, I'm going to get the buzzer sound basically. So so I'm going to get discharged in five minutes or ten minutes according to the UPS specific uh, location. Right, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Right. Any more questions? Any more questions from other members?